My name is Mike Leidermacher and I worked in GCSD, Government Communication Systems Division. Uh, at that time was RCA, of course, and we, I started in December of 1965. And I've been there since, uh, until 2013, 48 years. Okay, can you remember the first project you worked on? Actually, I could. Uh, the first project was a very interesting project. I was under the tutelage of a, an engineer who was designing a computer for the Navy. And the computer was under IR&D funds, Independent Research and Development. And he took me under his wing and he showed me how to design a computer. And actually, I was two months into the project, a young engineer, and the fellow who was the project engineer quit the company. And he told me, you're going to have to finish designing the whole computer, which to me, that was overwhelming. I just started with a company for two months, and I was responsible for designing the whole computer. And we did finish the computer design under IRED, and then we sold the computer under a project for the Navy, uh, where we develop, developed a, com a computer uh, oriented voice communication system that really landed on the land helicopter assault ships that is in use today. And we built about 20 systems and subsequent to that, those other developments. So it was a great job for me. Did they give you any uh, mentors or anything after this, uh, this gentleman quit? Actually, no. So I was, was kind of tough, but I enjoyed it a lot. And the fellow who really taught me the first two months, he was unbelievable. He gave me such a strong basis of how to design and left all his notes that he did a great job and I was able to carry on. Do you recall his name? Ted, Ted Campbell. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. He was a great guy. Mm -hmm. um, so just why don't you go over just some of the other major projects that you've worked on and what your recollections are from them? Yes. I mean, so that was the first one that was, it was called the CSP3 computer, which I designed. And then we got involved in the voice communication system for interior voice communications aboard a ship where we had to design the whole telephone switching system that was computer stored and automatic switching. I worked on that project and that project lasted about five years. And I was very fortunate for me that on that project, we had to actually have a system that was fully redundant aboard the Navy. You had an aft and a forward and you really had two computer systems that were making voice connect connections all the time. And if one computer system failed via a hit or a whatever, the other one took over automatically and none of the calls were, were lost, including in-process calls. And so we had to design a system that's called the synchronization of two computers, two independent computers, how you synchronize them, keep the data the same and switch when one fails and the other guy takes over. And I wrote, I had a patent on the synchronization of the two computers, of the two computers was a piece of hardware that RCA at that time refused to apply for a patent. So the Navy applied a patent for me and that was my first patent. So that was a great project for me. You remember what year that was? It was uh, 66 to 72. Mm -hmm. So that was the range of my first big project. Okay. How did this project affect your career? Oh, it was a great project for me because uh, we, it was very successful. We developed the project. We actually delivered to the Navy the first system. And subsequent to that, they gave us a big production order for what, what I was telling you, the land helicopter assault ships, which is really a, uh, a big ship that uh, houses helicopters and they use it today. So it was a big, big system. And subsequent to the big production, when I left in the 80s, the Navy gave us another production contract where we had to refurbish the computer. It was kind of big, and we redesigned it. And it was another group that did it. I was in another project. So, yeah, I got a lot of promotions and a lot of many awards. It was a very good project for me. Talk about your coworkers for a little bit. Yeah, well, in that project, I have to say I had tremendous help. The two fellows that I remember specifically, one is Bob Zeev. He was the project engineer on the, sh on the design. He was unbelievable. He knew, he knew switching systems, how to switch with relays 
automatically. He knew all about that. And that took me a long time to understand the concept. He taught me a lot. So Z was great. And my boss, Bill Lawrence, taught me how to do the software for automatic switching. I was a hardware guy, still am or was anyway. And I actually learned from him a lot of software concepts for storing forward switching and telephone switching. So he was great. Those two guys were, were the best. And with, with many other guys like Chris McGuinness, who actually helped me with synchronization of two computers. He was a great guy. I wonder where he is right now. So there was a lot of good people. And at those times, I have to say in the RCA days, somehow the camaraderie and the people were, were just great teamwork, great people. Hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you think RCA valued you as part of the project? They, I would say in terms of education, they always tried to uh, promote in-class cl uh, courses, always trying to teach you uh, uh, all kinds of technical stuff. So from that point of view, RCA was very good. And in fact, they encouraged me to get my master's, which I did at night. And that was a great thing from, from, from my electrical engineering. And they always encouraged you to think and do the right thing. So I, from that point of view, RCA was a great company. Did you feel that RCA recognized your work well? Well, I, uh, there was, they always had a recognition program, many recognition programs. In fact, I was part of the, a group that recognized good achievements and I voted for them. So yes, they always ran achievement programs. They had a great magazine called the RCA Magazine that highlighted all the technical aspects of what engineers did. That was a great magazine. So from a technical point of view, if you're a technical engineer, RCA was a great company. Okay. Now your career progressed beyond the computers yes. and things. Yes. Uh, in 72, uh, we were finishing that project I was telling you about, the Land Helicopter Assault Ship. And uh, at that time, one of my previous managers, Murray Rosenblatt, won a, an initial job, about $3 million, on an area that we hadn't done in the GCSD, and that was secure communications for the National Security Agency. So he knew me and he brought me along to work, interestingly enough, on a project that covered what I learned from him on interior voice communications. He wanted me to design what he called a simulator, a voice simulator, to be able to test this crypto gear that we were designing for the National Security Agency. And I was able to do that because I had learned the software from Bill Lawrence. So even though I was a hardware guy, I was giving a big software job to design a simulator to do voice communications. For at that time, we were developing the first digital voice communication system for the Army. And part of that big system called TriTech, we were the crypto guys, and GTE was developing the switching system for the Army. And it was all digital, the first all digital protocol system that the Navy was going to fill for TriTech. So he brought me into the, to what I call secure communications for NSA jobs. And that started me in a whole different career path where I actually stayed with them in, that, in the NSA business for over, till I retired, really. And uh, I grew into it. I became, what, you know, without bragging or anything like that, I became an expert in, in crypto. And that was a very good Thing. I loved it a lot. Yes, you were a recognized expert. Um, how was that different from your earlier career? Well, it was different that uh, the, the technology was a little different. You had to really learn about stuff that you never learned in school. Uh, you had to really like digital logic and mathematics, uh, stuff that random numbers. There's a, a lot of different technology, very different than voice communications. So I applied myself because I had one of the best teachers in, in, that, in that area. His name was Chip McGrogan. And then Chip, great guy. And uh, he was my tutor, really. He loved to teach, loved to teach everybody. So under his tutelage, I had an uh, opportunity to design stuff that I'd never done before. For example, we were developing miniaturized integrated circuits for the NSA work, which had to be low power and very small size. So we really started developing 
a group of, of uh, logicians that in, did integrated circuits because RCA had a laboratory for, for integrated circuits. And at that time, the technology, without getting into great detail, was 7.2 micron. And right now they're going to, God, reach 0.3 micron or 0.2 micron. So at the 7.2 micron technology, we were developing LSI logic. It's called large scale integration. And Chip showed me how to do logic design for crypto systems. He took me under his wing and said, okay, this is how you do it. And we designed a set of chips that were integrated in many, in many boxes for the NSA. And that was the first generation of large scale integration for the NSA chips that we developed. And subsequent to that, we developed the second generation of lower technology and we carried all the way to submicron. So at that time, for I would say from uh, 1973 to about 1990, we were developing many, many uh, large LSI devices that were incorporated into NSA devices for small power and, and uh, small size. And that really was great for us. That was revolutionary for us. NSA loved us. They gave us many, many jobs. And we shipped well over, I'd say well over a million systems to the NSA for distribution for the Army services, including the Army, Navy, and Air Force. And so that lasted for about 18 years or so. And then things changed. Things changed because with the onset of, comp of microelectronics computers like the Intel devices, and a lot of the FPGA, or field programmable gate array technology that came on board, LSI logic integrated circuits custom sort of went away. So we had to switch gear and find, continue the work on the NSA, but under different technology. What was it like working with the NSA people? I got to tell you something, the best. The best because number one, they were talented. They knew their technology. They're good engineers. They would like to work with you. They, they believed in their mission to get things done and help the, the warfighter. So I would say because of their savvy, their technology savvy, their, uh, their will to really get things done. And for at that time, thank God, we didn't have many restrictions of paperwork and, and regulations. And it was a different ball game that we just got the job done. And they helped us along with the, getting the job done. And so it worked out very, very well. It was very good. Cryptographers are a totally different group. What were those co-workers like? Well, some of them are a little weird, you know, uh, in terms of uh, uh, trying to tell you how things work. It's not easy to explain cryptography. And to really explain it, it takes a long time. And you have to develop a savvy to really learn it. So yeah, they were a little unusual, but still good guys. Good guys, yeah. Did you socialize with any of them? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. I have many friends, in fact, we still socialize to this day. You know, uh, we actually go twice a year to a, a, what is now a GE club, because as you may know, RCA was bought by, bought by GE, and there's an RCA club. So we, we, we see them a lot. And in fact, this is very apropos. I'm, Every, uh, a lot of my friends, like Mike Peparo, so, Steve Haas, they already retired, and we meet at least twice a year in, in, at the shore, and we go out for dinner, and we're going out August 26th with Nancy McCabe, who, is, who used to be my secretary, and with Mike Peparo and Steve Haas. So yeah, we do meet a lot still. Mm -hmm. um, people have talked several times about the term, the RCA family. What's that mean to you? The RCA family meant to me that you could always rely on people to help you, to be part of you. It wasn't just work. In other words, if you needed help, if, if you had a problem, they always came to help you. So, so from that point of view, you really felt that you were a family. They were like your relatives. It wasn't like, oh my God, I'm going to work the separate family, uh, work from family. It was a family. Can say the same thing for a lot of other places. Things changed dramatically, not dramatic, but things changed when our share was sold to GE. GE was more of a, uh, I would say, more of a bottom line company. 
and getting the job done in terms of cost, schedule, and money. Money was a big deal for them, so. A little different, even though I like GE too. I'm not gonna say I didn't like it. Did you, uh, you recall any of the parties or celebrations? Oh, RCA? yeah. Well, I tell you, Don Parker, who was our uh, quote unquote boss of the division, he would hold almost every year Christmas party for the whole group, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, where you meet everybody and we had a lot of fun. So the, every year we had a Christmas party and then the tradition continued for the different companies and the different people, including Charlie Schmidt, who used to be part of the ComSec area and, uh, area, and he became a big manager for satellite communications under Lockheed Martin. So yeah, that, that was very good. And we still also have what I call picnic parties in the summer. We'll get together and run an RCA picnic with all the engineers and their families. So that was very nice. Mm -hmm. What about the workplace itself? What was it like? Did you have the resources you needed? Um, what was the work environment like? Uh, I would say in general, yes. It was always, I mean, in terms of uh, research and development, there was always money funding issues. You couldn't do everything you wanted to really do. But generally speaking, they, uh, they gave you all the resources you needed to get the job done. I, I never had any problem with it. Mm -hmm. yeah. How did your supervisors treat you? Uh, I would say, honestly speaking, all my supervisors were great. I never had any trouble with them. And partly because I think my philosophy about, about work was if somebody gave me an assignment to do, I get it done. And if I made a commitment to get the assignment done under, let's say, a schedule that they asked me, how long will it take you? And can you do it? And I would provide the schedule and I would provide the, the cost. And if I, if I wouldn't make it, I would take it under my responsibility to really finish it under my, under my nickel, basically. So from that philosophy point of view, I think that my supervisors liked me and I never had problems with them. In fact, unfortunately for me, there was the system that RCA had, if you remember, they had what's called the EPR system. And the EPR system was earn, uh, earnings performance review or uh, something like that. Yeah, and, and they would give you higher points if you did a good job. Well, I had too many points. After, after a while, my points really did not, did not measure up to the salary I was giving you. So yeah, I got a lot of points, but the salary wasn't there. Meaning, I didn't want that many points, you know, that kind of stuff. But I had no problem with my, with my management. Mm -hmm. um, you took on some pretty important leadership positions uh, as your career progressed. Um, did you make any important decisions that affected the direction of RCA, or did you contribute to any of those decisions? That's a good question. I, uh, I, have a, I could tell you a lot of stories about that. I'd I'd like tell you, that. I'll tell you one that was, I'd say, very significant. It was a little interesting story. But number one, before I'll say that, I, one time I had about 300 engineers under me, and that was very difficult for me. Because to manage 300 and try to teach him and help him, it was difficult. I have to say that, especially when GE delayed, and all of the managers got delayed and they reported to me, and that was a tough problem, because I always wanted to teach the people, but 300 was kind of difficult. But saying all of that, I'll have to go to, and I, I'm sorry if I'm talking a lot about myself. You know, it's one of those things. There was one project that uh, we I worked on. It's called the mobile subscriber equipment, which was a uh, switching system, a mobile switching system for the army that in fact, in the 1990s, they used in Iraq. So it was an actual system. The mobile subscriber equipment was used extensively in the, the, during the first Iraqi war and the subsequent redesign is still being used by the army. It's a tactical secure communication system for wide area networks, including the battlefield. That was an unbelievable project. But the genesis of that project was that the army did not have any money to develop the project. So they put up a, an RFP saying, hey, I'm looking for a mobile subscriber equipment as an NDI, non-development item. Can anybody go and, and bid it? And us as a company, we said, no way can we do it. We can't fake the, the government to tell them we have it. It's no NDI, we no bid. And uh, there was, 
two companies who said, we have it. One was GTE, and the other one was a British company that, that developed the, the pitarmogen system. It was a British company. And so two, there was two bids, and GTE came to us to say, oh, look, Mr. and at that time, Mr. Parker was the, the, the manager of the crypto communications in RCA. He says, hey, listen, we want you to team with us, but we're not going to give you any money. I want you to commit to certain things, and you're going to get all the production of all the crypto for this mobile subscriber system. And Dan Parker never thought that this would ever take off because this was like billions of dollars. And they didn't believe, he did not not believe that GTE or the Army would ever fill this system. So he told GTE, no, we're not interested to even team with you. And I had, and I knew I was the crypto guy, and I knew a lot of guys from GTE, and they actually called me and said, Mike, how can Dan Parker not team with us? This is going to be big. And uh, so we got to do something. And I was really faced with a real dilemma because I was told by my management not to get involved. And yet I felt that it, this could be big. So not, not doing anything illegal, I did meet with GTE just to listen, listen, uh, listen them out and help them on my own to develop to a lot of questions they were asking me, even though we hadn't teamed. And because of the technical exchanges that I had with GTE, they went ahead and made some assumptions and bid themselves the system, assuming a few things. But we had no agreement, and they won. Once they won, with the ideas that I helped them develop, they went to the army and said, look, even though it's a non-NDI item, we have to develop one little thing. And we have, we, we have the company, it's RCA, and what we had to do, we had to develop a crypto box that was supposed to go to a, to a French radio. GTE also teamed with the French for the radio component because they had the NDI element. And, and the army was like, we said NDI. So, so GT said, look, it's not going to be in the development money. It's the same fixed cost, we're taking the risks. It's the development, but we are making NDI, we're developing it ourselves. And with that idea, once they won, GT came back to Dan Parker and said, look, we've been talking with Mike. We want you to be with our, par our partner to develop the crypto. A lot of the crypto we had, this development we didn't. So the idea was, look, you, you produce all this crypto that you already have and do the development under Mike for this French radio. And tell me the, the development money is going to cost you. Just give me an estimate. We'll give you the money. That's what GT said. So Dan Parker went along with that. And to make the story short, that program won GT about $8 billion. We made probably a billion dollars, and we made a ton of money. Dan Parker got promoted. He was like a hero in the company. Fortunately for me, his boss recognized I had something to do with it. And in between that time, RCA was sold to GE, and his boss, not without Dan Parker knowing, gave me some stock options for GE, which was really great. And GTE really liked me a lot. And that, that was a great project, but there's so many stories to that because I got to tell you something else. During the development of this crypto for the French radio, we had to go to France to test it. And, and we had to take this US crypto that was classified top secret, right? And we had to take it to France. So we took it, uh, you know, what is called the Air Force Courier. They took it to the U.S. Embassy. We took a separate trip to, per to Paris with one of my engineers. And the, the embassy called us and says, your, your package has arrived to let us know. And we had to, see, this is classified, and we couldn't tell the French anything. We had to keep it under our total control while we took it to the French company, Thompson, and tested with the radio. And, and remember, we just developed it. They had a radio, we plugged it in. Of course, it took us a week to make it work. It wasn't an easy thing, but that was such a great time. Me going to France under these circumstances, watching with the US Embassy, holding something, stop secret, couldn't tell anybody. But it was all legal. 
because we went through the Air Force security. That, that was a great project. That's a terrific story. Yeah. Um, do you have any other recollections of these pressured or difficult times during the developments on the project you worked on? Oh, I do remember one. The one that was a, that previous, you know, I was telling you about this interior voice communication system. In one, when, when we delivered the switching system to Pascagoula, Mississippi, where they were building the ship, the LHA ship, they installed our equipment and they were making voice connections. And somehow the system was making the voice connections. However, it was also making random other connections, meaning if the captain was talking to somebody, all of a sudden the cook would come in and interfere with the call. And, that, and so, so the system had a lot of problems with these extra connections. I was already working in the crypto area. And at that time, my manager, Jim Fayer, who was the manager of the voice communication system, he, tr he sent about 20 different engineers to fix the problem in Pascagoula, Mississippi. And they couldn't fix it. So they said, well, who knows about this LHA stuff? I had already left. He says, well, Mike Latimer knows, but he's working crypto. You can't touch him. They went to my management and they said, we got to get him a week to Pascagoula, Mississippi. So making the story short, I went to Pascagoula and I, I arrived to the shipyard and they showed me what the problem was. And I was by myself. I felt when I, they gave me a hat and they actually said, the RCA engineer is here. And it was a big, loud boo, like boo. And the, the reputation at that time was horrible. So here I am, this little guy coming in to try to fix this voice communication switching. And let me tell you, that was the most frightening period of my life. I didn't know, first of all, I didn't know what to do, number one. I didn't know where to start. But I had to do something, so I started troubleshooting on my own, spent about a week. And it's a long story of how I found the problem. But I did find the problem, and the problem was there was extra you know, the telephone switching system had a gigantic backplane with millions of wires. And believe it or not, there was extra wires in the backplane that was installed incorrectly by the integrator of the sh of ship, Litton Industries. They were doing some testing, and there was a what's called a cross-connection field that gave you the option, but they never removed the wires. And the wires they used were the same color wires as the backplane. So you couldn't tell where the extra wires was. I was lucky that I found one. Once I found one, I said, oh my God, this has got to be it. And I started searching for extra, and I looked at the wire list, and wherever there was an extra wire, which is called the second level wiring, the third level wiring, it was a third level wiring that meant like an extra wire. So I was looking for pins that had an extra level wiring. And I said, hey, that's got to be an extra wire, because normally RCA would do the back with two level wiring. So that's how I found all these extras. So it took me a week to remove about 200 wires. And when I removed the 200 wires, I, I went to the captain and said, okay, I think I fixed the problem. Just make calls. And he looked at me like, yeah, you know you gotta be kidding me. This thing has not been working for months. We already told our share we're shipping the system back. We want our money back. You're talking $30 million. So just give it a try. And they started making calls and nothing. They worked for hours and hours, making millions of calls, not everything were great. Finally said, you fixed it. And that was, that was a great story for me too. So It's not always the money that you get, it's the satisfaction that you get of, of doing something, you know? Yeah. That, was a, that was a great story. Yeah. Any more? Well, I have some more, but uh, we'll, we'll keep it like that. Yeah. What was the best thing about working for RCA? For me, the, for me, the best thing I would say is I was fortunate that even though I was working government communication systems, that I was not working on offensive warfare. Now, had I been working on offensive, maybe I would have done it, I don't know. But I was working on, on an equipment and technology that helped and defended the warfighter. So from that point of view, I felt I saved lives. Uh, you know, I wasn't using weapons of mass destruction. I was using crypto to save lives. So that was very satisfying. So even though people say, how can you work for the government? You know, they do so many blah, blah, bad things. 
Uh, well, and the truth is, I was only working on the defensive technology, which may, and I, I was saving lives. So from that point of view, it was very satisfying. Yeah. What was the worst thing about working for RCA? The worst thing working for RCA? Uh, can't really think of many things. Worst thing work. Well, I never got enough money. You know, I could have gotten better raises. You know, it's always the funny thing about things when you work. My father told me a long time, if you want to be rich, don't ever work for somebody else. Get your own business. And it's, it's, it was true for RCA, it was true for GE. You know what? You're not going to get rich working for somebody else. So if there's any one regret that I have in my life that's too late for me is I never went out and did my own business. That's something that I probably regret. But, you know, it's a small regret. RCA was a place where we have heard about people meeting their wives, their girlfriends, and so forth. Do you have any recollections there? Well, from an engineering point of view, it happened a lot. It didn't happen to me. I was already, when I graduated, I was already engaged. Mm -hmm. But yeah, many people met their wives uh, through the RCA workforce. and and lived happily ever after. So yeah, that was a great place to meet your, uh, your, uh, your prefer preferred other and, and uh, develop a long-term relationship or getting married. Yeah, it happened a lot. What's your assessment of, the, of RCA's standing in industry? Today? No, when RCA existed. Oh, when RCA existed, at one time it was the premier company from a technology point of view. Because besides doing government communications, they were very heavily in commercial, as you know. And they, they were the leader in the televisions. So, so it was very high, except when they started making some management changes where they were buying a lot of companies that was not related to the technology just to make the stock grow. So their, their uh, stock went down a little bit from that point of view. Mm -hmm. But David Sarnoff, the Sarnoff Research Library is world-renowned. That was a... At that time, it was one of the best research places in the world. So from that point of view and the technology point of view, they were number one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how would you sum up your time at RCA? Just a job? Just RCA or the whole time? R well, let's, let's do RCA and then talk okay. about the whole time. Well, I felt that uh, the best thing that RCA gave me as a start, they had the best training program for engineers. When I came out of college, I had zero knowledge about what the profession was. I mean, I was green, really green. So what RCA did is, they didn't give you an assignment right away. They uh, selected you to different divisions of your own choosing to give you a training and, and see what you like. So from that point of view, as a starting engineer, what a program where you actually go for eight months, I think it was eight months, where you go to different assignments for six weeks and you get to taste what other divisions do. And it happened to me where I actually went to work to the, in the Morristown plant and I went to the Camden plant and the Burlington plant and yet I chose, quote unquote, one of the worst plants of RCA, which was at, at that time Camden was a little dangerous, you know, that kind of stuff. But guess what? I went to work to Camden. Why? Because I saw what they were doing. I was interested. So I got my shot of working at what I liked and RCA gave me that chance. So that, so, so that was a, a great thing from, my, from that point of view, what RCA gave me, that fundamental training to get me started as an engineer. And that's priceless, really. And then your pro career progressed into the GE acquisition. Yeah, and so forth. Uh, right. And the GE, GE was a very different company because they were, as I said, they were taking over a lot of companies. We felt like we were taking over the RCA, got sold. So GE was different, but and a lot of people didn't like GE. I, 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 I did not mind them because I thrived while under GE also, meaning they were fair in terms of assessing me, and they, they did give you stock options uh, if you performed okay. So I was okay with GE also. And Jack Walsh may have been a tough cookie in terms of telling you like it is, but sometimes it's good to hear what telling you what it is and tell you something that's not true. You know, so yeah. 
uh, I didn't mind GE. I actually like GE more than Martin Marietta or Lockheed Martin. Uh, Lockheed Martin was a strange company, very impersonal. Uh, they were not a GE, they were not RCA. I wasn't sure what Lockheed Martin was. Uh, so I was happy when Lockheed Martin so, uh, created, sold us to a new company called L3. And L3 was a small company, but because it was a small company, we had a chance to really uh, cap capitalize on its growth and get rewarded. So L3 was a very good company for me because at that time, I was fortunate to meet the CEO, Jack um, Lanza. What's his first Frank, name? Frank, Frank Lanza, Frank I'm sorry. Lanza. Frank Lanza. I met him in his office, and he was a unbelievable person in terms of getting things done. I remember then when they, he wanted to really go into this commercial crypto. He says, you guys do crypto, let's commercialize it. And our manager looked like, cross, I forget commercial, it's not going to work. So he says, look, I want to hear ideas about commercial. And he had asked me for one idea, and we came up with what's called a uh, very cheap, very inexpensive voice communication box that gets hooked up to every telephone that you could call anywhere in the world, secure communications for anybody. He loved it. So he said, okay, Mike, I want you to come up with Joanna Shuko, my boss at that time, present it to me. And Joanna was very excited. She was really a nice person. I mean, a nice person, I liked her. Some people may not have liked her. And, and we prepared the paper to present to, to Lanza about this idea. And we went there to the to RCA, to RCA building. He had a beautiful building in uh, New York. We presented the idea, and he loved it. And he said, okay, how much is it gonna cost? So I said, I think at that time I told him $2 million. I may have said a million dollars. I forget the number. I think it's a million to develop this little thing. He says, you got it. I don't want to hear anybody else. Joanna, give him a million dollars. And guess what? We developed it. And we sold a lot of units for it. And that was successful, but it wasn't in the millions. Rich, do you remember how many units we sold? Private Yeah, private tell. Yeah, probably 100,000 units. Like it. a lot of companies who wanted to go to China to, to, to do secure communication, they bought this little device that gets hooked up to any telephone. You're able to dial normally and then press a button, go secure, and you went secure. And so that private tell box was $400. But in the commercial world, $400 is still a lot of money. And that was part of the problem about going commercial. People don't want to pay even $400. So we sold 100000 but it was successful. So that was a nice project. Okay. <clears throat> Do you have any other stories or... Um Incidents that you'd like to uh, tell us about? Uh, let's see. Uh, incidents or stories. Well, uh, Greg Roberts, you know Greg Roberts. Mm -hmm. He was our uh, president of L3. And I had a lot of respect for Greg Roberts. I think he was probably one of the smartest guys I ever met. And to me, he was the nicest guy I ever met. Uh, some people may disagree with that. I liked him a lot. And he, because of his nature and his attitude, he actually motivated me. And uh, I felt that under his tutelage, under his guidance, he also listened to me. And one big thing that he listened, thank God, because the previous manager of the, of the company, when we suggested that idea, he said, no way. But what it was is we had developed this two, three, secure voice communication box. And the next generation was ready to go. And it was called the T secure terminal equipment. And it required a lot of money development on our own. And we presented the idea to, 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 me, to him. And he said, he very gutsy says, let us do this. This is the right thing to do. He made the right decision, even though many managers prior to that did not. And when he made that decision, he gave us the money. It was millions of dollars to do it. The, the NSA gave us some seed money, but not enough. Anyway, we won that job, and we, sh we shipped secure thermal equipments. That made the division, really. I think you know, Jim, that the secure thermal equipment. I think we must have shipped 300,000 units. 335,000. Right. Yes. And it was really Greg Roberts who needed to say, yes, we're going to do it. And 
Because many of them, the managers I worked previously, they were Mr. No. No, cost too much money, I don't have money. And he said, yes, we're going to do it. That was great. And it helped Camden for many years, still probably does. And that was the beginning of a great cycle of crypto gear in Camden. Now, you had competition in that development. Yes. What happened there? Well, uh, you heard the story. Maybe I should have repeated it. Well, the competition was Motorola at that time, who was developing a similar device. And so there was two companies developing. We had to show a demonstration in so many months. And we finished the development. Motorola could not finish the development. But they had to ship 300 units to the government. That was the contract. The government says, you've got to give me 300 units. Well, we gave them 300 units. And the Motorola came to us and begged that we should sell them 300 of our units so they can satisfy the contract to ship the units to the government. So they bought 300 units from us to ship to the government. And that was unbelievable because Motorola was our main competitor in this thing. I don't think they ever forgave us for that. You know, it was really a tough thing for them. But yeah, it's a true story. Yeah, I think that showed the, uh, the quality of the, um, the crypto people that we had. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Absolutely great. Okay. The number of engineers still there. I mean, uh, great people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay, Mike, anything else you want to uh, share with us? Well, I tell you, I have to say this. I worked um, for the company 38 years. And then I decided to retire when I was 60. But, but uh, of course, you know, you know, even though you're happy, it's still stressful. Nobody's going to say it's not stressful. I mean, we were working. You had to deliver. There was a lot of stresses. So I wanted to retire. But the, the week before re that I retired, Joanna Shuko took me around to a new floor that she was developing. She says, Mike, look, if you come back to work for me as a consultant, I'm going to give you this office. And she showed me this gigantic office overlooking the river. So my retirement party was Thursday, and I came back to work Monday for 10 years as a consultant under Joanna. And I have to tell you, those 10 years that I worked as a consultant were the best years of my career. Why? Because I had zero responsibility about any administration, about any people, any headaches, any squabbles, any politics, any nothing. The only thing I did was technical presentations, the technical proposals. And for 10 years, I felt like I rediscovered my engineering talent. I felt like an engineer again. And I, stay, I would have stayed longer, but my wife was complaining. So I retired 10 years later, best 10 years. So I really worked total 48 years in the five companies. And what am I doing now? I'm happy retired. I love it. Good. How were you able to come back after you retired? Wasn't there some regulation there? That the regulation started after. After. Wow. I was very lucky that I did not have to wait six months. Some of the fellows who tried to come back, they instituted a rule, oh, wait a minute, there's a, some monkey business maybe going on or whatever. Everything was legal, but they said, you can't come back, come back as a consultant, you got to wait six months. In my case, there was no regulation then. So I came back like that. I was lucky, very lucky. 